who is our speaker tonight. And Dr. Hammond, how are you doing? I am doing well. I am doing well. How about you? I am doing very well. Thank you. Um, you know, this technology, sometimes it can be good and sometimes it's not. Uh, yeah. You can start recording now. <laughs> All right. Yep. You're on. All right. So, um, so Dr. Hammond is going to talk tonight about um, something that's really been in the news. Everyone knows it's been in the news uh, concerning our kids and the recent killings of of black men and women and and the effect that it has on our kids and um and and some of the tips and things that we could do to help them through this time because i i was watching something this morning and um i don't know if you saw it dr hammond it was a little boy um he was outside playing and his father was recording him did you see that and he I hit did. behind the car when he uh -huh. saw the and that was really that broke my heart mm -hmm. uh, so uh, before we get started, can you just go ahead and do an introduction of yourself? Yes, I'm Dr. Nakisha Hammond. I host on Dr. Jackie King's um, Black Women Empowered Facebook page, which now has 1.9 million followers and is exciting. Uh, the BWE Mental Health Moment every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm also a psychologist for the past 11 years. And, um, and I do a lot of work with the media surrounding mental health and wellness, particularly with kids um, and teens. And I am also the mom of a seven-year-old son and, um, and, uh, and the wife for the past 12 years uh, with my husband just raising a family. So um, yeah, it's, it's been a lot to your point, Dr. King, of everything that's been happening right now, but I'm sure we'll get into all that and just some resources to help people. Yeah, and and so Dr. Hammond, your your specialty is children, mm -hmm. and uh, I want you to talk about your your book uh, later on, um, raising emotionally healthy children. So talk a little bit about before we go further, um, why you chose the field with children, and um, and a little bit about that before we we get into uh, our topic. Yeah, yeah, I get that question a lot. Um, so. What I have always found fascinating about working with children is that it's not really just about their childhood when you work with children. It's about impacting their life at a point where you literally can change their entire life. You can change, uh, you can change a child's teenage years. You can change their adult life by how we treat them with early intervention and many things to really deal with all of the stress that they're having in the early years. So that's always been very exciting to me in mental health, just to reach kids early so they don't have to go through the unnecessary suffering when they're an adult. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that makes sense. Um, has it been rewarding? I know it can be trouble, troubling at times to see, yeah. with, um, you know, mental illness depression and all of that it, it has been rewarding the most frustrating part right now is really the systems that kids are in the the educational system and sometimes even the mental health system and how kids are treated i'm sure we'll, we'll get into that but just the racism that exists and the discrimination that exists for certain kids depending on how they look or their ability levels that that is the most frustrating part um, but what I do when I do work with kids and do psychological evaluations has been really, really rewarding to help parents and teachers when I talk with teachers get on a better path uh, for these kids. Right. So, so now um, that we're in this whole Black Lives Matter thing and um, and kids are dealing with several things. They're dealing with the fact that a lot of them couldn't graduate. Mm -hmm. they, can't, they can't have play dates. They a lot of them can't. I mean, all of their activities, most of them have been been you know, like stopped. Yep. And so, in addition to that, now they're thinking about, you know, am I going to get shot by the police? Mm -hmm. uh, 
my daddy or my mommy's going to get shot by the police. So, I mean, it's just, it's, it's a lot. Yeah. So talk a little bit about, you know, how you counsel and, and some advice that our listeners can use when dealing with these issues, because I mean, the parents are stressed out too. Yeah. <laughs> Um, absolutely true. Um, it, it is. It's been, it's been so much over the past couple of, uh, <laughs> hi Paula. <laughs> it's been so much over the past couple of months, really, with the coronavirus, like you said, and all of the disappointment, unfortunately, that kids have had to deal with. Even the young ones. I have a seven-year-old. He just finished second grade. We tried to make a big deal and have a little party and celebration at the end, but of course he didn't get to see his friends for months. So that's difficult. Graduations being canceled, the list goes on and on. And then on top of that now, the world, because this is a global movement at this point, is starting to, to really see, we already know it's been there, how horrific the treatment has been for Black people over time. And now, there's more emphasis on anti-racism education and diversity and inclusion. And so those are the positive things out of it. Unfortunately, it took a lot of people dying for this to happen. Um, but again, kids are affected, like you said, parents are affected, parents are already stressed out with everything happening, but there's a lot of resources to, to really help right now with this process. Um, so what are some of the resources? Yeah, I would, so for the little ones, for the young kids, um, I would highly recommend for parents to watch the CNN Sesame Street Town Hall on Racism. I watched that with my seven-year-old son and it was so good. It was an hour, um, but it had the Sesame Street characters. They had all these kids that looked, you know, all different, black kids, brown kids, white kids, you know, every culture, if you will. And they were three, four, five, six years old. And they were asking real questions, again, to the Sesame Street character, because they wanted it to be age appropriate. But they were asking real sad, though, I was actually crying throughout it, because sad questions for their age about, uh, to your point, Dr. King, what's going to, is somebody going to hurt me? And I go outside? Is a police officer going to kill me? Is someone going to, you know, judge me for how I look? I mean, all these innocent questions, but I thought that they did an excellent job on explaining racism. This is a conversation that I have had multiple times um, with my own son. And um, I would highly recommend that as a resource. The American Psychological Association also has an excellent resource about how to deal with racial trauma, because this is not just something that's happened today in 2020. It's been, I mean, it's been for hundreds of years, but a lot of things that are happening today have reminded people of a very dark past. And there's a lot of healing that needs to happen for parents too, <laughs> um, and kids. So, so I would highly recommend those as two good starting points. There's a ton more resources, but I would say those are two good starting points. Mm. Uh, well, yeah, so I, I, I actually watched that. You sent that to me and um, it, it, yeah, it was, it was a lot. So, Mm -hmm. how do how do the parents um keep from falling apart you know in the middle of this i mean you're trying to you're trying to you know keep your child you know um mm -hmm. you know with uh, a positive attitude and i mean we're locked in i've been in for i don't even know now i can't i think it's four months <laughs> i don't yeah. know but I mean, you know, and, and a lot of people can't deal with the, the isolation and the, yeah. the not, the, you know, the lack of socialization and all of that. So what can you say to the parents? How can they hold it together? Yeah. And first of all, I would say if you're having a difficult time, that is very normal right now and very, a very common feeling, especially for parents and caregivers. Because like you mentioned, it's a lot. Um, it's hard to give this advice, but I'm still gonna give it. It's still important though to take care of yourself. Very, very important. I know right now I've seen the 40 million plus people as far as the data for unemployment. 
and what's happening with the schools and what's happening with protests is is so much but it's even that much more important for parents especially and caregivers to be taking care of themselves whatever that looks like for you uh the the thing that um it was last week on mental health moment that i was recommending to everyone is literally to if you have to take your cell phone and set a timer for two minutes in a day hopefully every day but maybe a couple days a week or once a week but two 120 seconds two minutes to give yourself a break at a minimum if you have more time great but at a minimum take the time take some time to have some deep breathing to block everything out, to unplug for a second from the news and the media and all of that that's distressing, um, to really recharge your batteries, if you will, because if not, it, you will burn out. It's, this is a lot to deal with. Um, so I am highly encouraging people to take care of themselves. Also, if you are trying everything you can at home to take care of yourself and to take care of your kids and you're like, I cannot do this, alone is too much then i highly recommend that people reach out to a mental health professional even right now during coronavirus times there are many psychologists many mental health professionals that are doing teletherapy that are doing telehealth um so you could be at home on your cell phone your tablet laptop or whatever doing video sessions um if you're concerned about coronavirus um, but please please i'm urging people to really reach out to someone, friend, family, or and or mental health counselor right now, because it's it's a lot to process. It really is. And I I never used to turn off my cell phone, mm. but I actually turn it off now. Mm -hmm. um, because if it's on, I'm gonna be looking at it or something, doing something. So I practice actually turning it off, especially when it's time to go to bed. Yeah. Um, that it's not good to have them in your room anyway, mm -hmm. but I just I just completely turn everything off mm -hmm. uh, because, like I said, if you have it there, you're going to pick it up, you're going to hear a ding, and then you're going to be looking at it, and then you're going to get a text, and then you're going to get on wondering what they're doing on Facebook and blah blah blah. So yeah, I I think it, it, it's it's helping me mm -hmm. just just you know shut everything down and and I'm a news buff so. <laughs> so I I could watch the news twenty four hours a day seven days a week. So I you know started finding me good movies to watch. Um, if you're on if you're on a, if you're streaming, there's a free streaming movie called Tubi, uh, and uh, I actually um, like it because it has it has a variety. Have you ever heard of it? I haven't heard of that one. Yeah, it's you don't even have to pay for it. It's T U B I, and oh, it has okay. uh, it has it has so many movies. And they, <laughs> they actually what they do is they play when one ends. Please, please mute if you just can't. Please mute. Please mute. <laughs> I think it's better now. <laughs> oh, there we go. Dr. King, you're muted now. <laughs> I muted myself. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's okay. I thought I muted someone else. <laughs> Um, but anyway, uh, what I was saying, it'll play, it'll, it'll, um, play one movie right after another, but so that's another way to do it. Music is really good. Talk about that. Cause I, I love to listen to jazz. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Music is, it really has been shown actually, especially with music to, to change your energy levels. Again, whatever type of music, everybody has every, you know, different types of music that, that they enjoy. But the, the main thing right now is if it's something that brings you joy, that is what needs to be occurring right now. It still can mean you're advocating. It still can mean if you want to go physically to protest, or I know 
there's virtual protests that you organize Dr. King or whatever fashion of what's happening right now to, to advocate and to move in that direction. But at the same time, still experiencing joy. If it's through music, if it's through movies, comedies, something, um, because that's allowed. A lot of people have a hard time with feeling like that's allowed or feeling guilt for that. Um, but again, these things are important, especially for parents, because if you're going to be, if you're going to bring the best version of who you are as a parent, you have to be taking care of yourself. Absolutely. And your kids can detect when you're not okay. Is that correct? Oh, yes. And let me tell you, I've had <laughs> so many conversations, in particular with these really young children who are very perceptive they even though i've been working with kids for over a decade they still surprise me because i'm like how do you know that there are some things that little four and five year olds and six year olds will tell me about what's going on in their house and all sorts of things that i'm like how do you even know that they're so perceptive so even though some parents think that they're trying to hide their feelings about graphic things that they may be watching in the media or reactions to the protests and those sort of things. Kids, absolutely, they're smart. <laughs> um, and they pick up on that. Like you said, they they can feel the, the sadness or the anger and those sorts of things. So that's why it's so important. We really have to be processing with them, having conversations about racism. It's never too early. I strongly, strongly believe in starting this conversation in preschool years with kids to understand no matter what they look like, the conversation is gonna be different depending on what they look like, but no matter what they look like and what color skin they have, we have to have the conversation about racism and prejudice and discrimination and how they can help, maybe be an ally. If they're a white child or if you're a black child, how amazing you are despite what you look like and what society is gonna tell you about yourself. That's absolutely not true. So these are, these are just really critical conversations that we need to continue having with kids. So moving forward, do you believe that the schools should, I mean, they, they haven't addressed this, but do you believe they should be addressing this in the school? Yes, <laughs> strongly. Um, I, well, the article hasn't been published yet, but there's a, an article that'll be coming out next month um, in, a, in a magazine, a local magazine here. And I, that was actually one of the questions they asked me as well. I strongly, strongly believe that they need to have curriculum right now for preschoolers specifically about racism, anti-racism um, education, and kindergarten through 12th grade as well. So Jackie ain't seen me and seen me. Oh, you're right. You're right. All right, I'm gonna need you to mute your phone, please, Serena. Uh, we can hear you, we're, we're, we're recording. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so absolutely, so preschool should have an education curriculum, age appropriate. Kindergarten through 12th grade should have a curriculum. Again, of course, if you're seven years old versus 17, the conversation is gonna be different. Um, and a lot of ground rules, especially for the older kids or the teens, putting the ground rules in place, they are hungry to talk about this. This idea that we need to brush race or you know, what you look like racism to the side or talk about it for a week in school, like that's, it, that's not enough. Um, if we really truly as a society or trying to move past this idea of racism um, and eradicate it and change the healthcare and the education system and all the other systems that need to be changed. So yes, I am a strong advocate. This needs to be a part of the curriculum in school. And this idea, which is one of my least favorite words on the planet, is colorblindness. Because it's not true. So this idea that little kids are colorblind, they don't even see color. It's not true. <laughs> My own son, when he was four years old, it was so hard um, when he came home from school one day and he talked about, he wondered and he was upset why he didn't have what he called peach skin. So that's what he called that for, for white people. And it was really hard and disheartening because he already learned, he was four. And in, in his mind, it was like, well, white is better or peach, peach skin um, back then. So we had to have a lot of conversations about that and about how amazing he was, no matter his hair texture, his color of his skin or whatever it is. Um, so again, kids are already seeing these types of differences in preschool ages, which is why we have to start this education early. 
So do you believe that, I mean, it starts, because I've heard many times it starts from the parents. The parents teach racism um, because kids don't really come here knowing it. So do you believe it is a learned behavior? Oh yeah, definitely. There's, I don't believe there's anybody on this planet that's born a racist. Um, some, some families unintentionally um, promote racism without even realizing it. Um, in some families it is more blatant. Um, everyone has some type of what we call implicit bias that everyone has biases, but the difference is right. And right now what I'm seeing, which is amazing and exciting is many people right now, many parents right now are saying, Hey, what do I need to teach my kids? By the way, on Amazon, there's a ton of resources for kids, for parents to teach kids about racism. Some of them, I went, um, you know, to order some and to look at some and to review some more and they're sold out, which I was excited about. I'm like, yay. So, so parents already are, are taking the time to, to really say, how can I raise a child that's not a racist? What do I need to know? What do I need to teach my child? Um, and again, like I said, for some parents, it's, it's unintentional. And for some parents, it's blatant as ever. Or the school system they're in, it's very blatant or subtle. But either way, parents definitely have a role. This is something that can be unlearned. If someone is watching or listening to this later, that maybe has a 10 year old, you know, it's not something that can't be unlearned. Um, and, and again, as I mentioned, the, the good thing is that uh, there's ways for families to teach their kids how to help others. If you have privilege and what does that mean and how can you be an ally to someone else? Hmm. Um, so, you know, I'm, I remember the, well, vaguely remember the riots when Martin Luther King, because I was a young girl, but I do remember Rodney King and, and all of those riots. Um, but th this is different. So it appears, it appears that um, non-people of color finally get what we've been dealing with, um, you know, for ever, <laughs> pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, do you believe that this is going to, to change the way everybody thinks? I mean, it, I mean, the marches are one thing, but if it's going to change the way you look at stuff, do you believe it, it will? It can, yes. And, well, if I'm being brutally honest, no, I don't think everyone, but, but I do think that uh, this time period, though, is different because I have seen being on... Um, Anyways, being on some other meetings with different organizations, whether it's American Psychological so Association or some other groups, it, you, I felt like it used to be that we were just having some town halls and discussing things, and man, this is sad. Now it's different, though. Like, there are changes that are already happening currently as we speak. There are changes legislatively that have already happened. There are changes that are being recognized. There are major corporations that are donating millions and millions of dollars to, to say, which didn't happen even a couple of years ago. Well, we can get into that later about the Colin Kaepernick experience. But, but now, like just using their voice to say, hey, this is wrong. Here's what we're going to do about it. We're going to put, we're going to do this. We're going to diversify our whatever, our board or our employees, or we're going to do this in education. So. And there's a lot of committees, task force, and that sort of thing that's being formed right now, instead of just talking about, man, that's really sad someone died. We're, we're way past that. <laughs> this is a global movement. <laughs> this is like, when I see people, like, and all, I got so excited, by the way, when those pictures started coming out, and we, we got to see that other countries were coming on board and saying, this is wrong. You can't, you can't treat black people like this. Like, how can we help? What do we need to do to move forward? And it's that part has been very beautiful. But yeah, there's a lot of changes. So I think this time is very different. We have a long way to go, but there's action items and steps that are currently happening instead of just talking about it. Mm -hmm. And and so one of the things that really um, you know concerns me is. Um, are they going to tie 
uh, you know, the poverty they talk about. Are you going to tie the poverty, the lack of, of, um, of uh, medical uh, resources? Are you going to tie that all in? Because mm -hmm. when you look at, you know, crime, black on black crime, it's really out of this. When you look at it, most of it is out of despair mm -hmm. because you just don't see any hope for anything. Uh, do you think that that's going to help with people funding, you know, making sure that uh, the, the lower income areas are, you know, have better resources for housing and mm -hmm. water. Even, even Michigan, Michigan is still, still dealing with contaminated water today. <sighs> I know. Don't even get me started on that. That's, that's like a five hour conversation. I went to Flint, Michigan on a service trip uh, with one of the boards I'm on. So ugh, yeah, um, very difficult, but I, but I agree. There's a lot of, so one of the things that is happening when people hear defunding the police, which sounds very radical, we're just going to take all the police officers away and we're not going to be safe. Absolutely not true. That's not what that is. But really, to your point, it's about thinking about, hey, let's take some funds away from the police, let's say, and put it into other programs, into community programs, whether it's mental health, whether it's health care that's needed, what are our true needs in the community? So I think what's going to end up, well, what's already happening is there's a lot of districts and communities that are now starting to think, wait a second, we need to start reallocating some dollars. We need to think about what works. And luckily, there are many people, researchers, information where we already know what the solutions are. It's not like we're at point A. We already know what the solutions were. We just had not have any funding to make those things happen to help people. So now if we can say, okay, let's reallocate how we're spending these dollars and put it into programs that help children, that help people with less income, that help the education system and healthcare, legal system, all these things, then we will start to see changes. Um, as you know, I think you know that I used to sit on the police review board in oh, Green. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You remember that? So yes. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that used to really tick me off is, um, well, the president just signed this bill. We're supposed to be mental health professionals are supposed to accompany um, police uh, in a crisis. So that was the biggest thing that I saw. Most of the people who were filing these complaints, they had mental, you could see, I, I'm not even a mental health professional. And I could tell as soon as the video started rolling, something's not right with this person. They're not mm -hmm. just out there doing whatever. They need some help. Mm -hmm. And there was really big cases too, uh, you know, that, that we dealt with. So um, do you believe that that's going to happen? I know it's needed. And how would that look? I mean, how is, is the police going to be trained to know when the person is in a, a, a mental health crisis? How, how are they going to know? I would love if that, I would love if that training occurred. Um, I know specifically with police departments, they, there's certain districts and certain districts decide how funding is used and for what training and that sort of thing. I definitely think that needs to be trained. Um, one of the things that used to happen for whatever, anyways, different, a series of reasons why some of my patients, I would have to call um, an officer for, like I said, different situations. I, I would be terrified sometimes because I wasn't sure what type of officer would be coming to deal with, let's say, an abuse report or whatever it was. Sometimes I would have officers that showed up that had or showed some type of empathy <laughs> and realized this was someone dealing with mental health and a slew of other things that had happened. And then other times I would have officers that showed up and I was terrified um, for this child because it was a horrific exchange. Mm -hmm. um, so does mental health training need to happen for officers? Yes. Um, what, they, what, they, what I've seen in some of the articles that they're proposing is that mental health professionals be a part, like you said, of nonviolent calls. Um, but if a person, I don't know, sometimes people will call the police because there's someone that's homeless on the street and they're dancing or talking to themselves or something like that. 
So bringing a mental health officer instead of that person being killed because they might be agitated because of a mental health issue, um, they would have a mental health trained professional to go with that officer, let's say, to process what's going on with that person. So it's certain things like that. Um, so that's a lot to sort through, but yes, there is, a, I think, a lack of understanding uh, what's happening with a person that has, and we've seen so many of those cases in the news that has mental health conditions. I mean, there've been, unfortunately, kids with, or I say kids, but even teens with autism or, or something that they're not resisting arrest, they're, they're nonverbal, let's say, or something like that. And it just gets so mixed up and it's very sad. Um, so I definitely think there needs to be more training in the mental health end with kids, teens for, for officers, for sure. Yeah, and then it seems like it's, it gets really escalated when it's a, an African-American. Oh, yeah. Um, they they are they they're coming out with the guns up you know that's just i mean that's just the way i see it and i served on the board i was going to say you served on yep mm -hmm. so you know uh so it it has to change uh that's that's one thing that i think out of all the stuff that that needs to happen that is so important because in many cases the person is not their normal self Mm -hmm. They're having an, an episode, I guess that's what you would call it. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so uh, now, now let me tell you too, I went through the police, um, Citizens Police Academy. Now on the defense of the police, we did a simulation. I don't know if you've ever seen that on what would you do if yeah. you, well, I actually ended up killing my partner because yeah. I was, I had this adrenaline rush. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you have to you have to look at that side too. Something we don't talk about yeah. that often, but the cops they want to they want to go home too. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I agree with you. I I did um, FBI Citizens Academy training also, and we had a simulation where you know the guns and the simulation yeah. of what you would do, and it is it's it's it is difficult. Again, I mean, I've never served as a police officer. I I can imagine that that's difficult too, but that's why. There needs to be training um, to really understand some of the differences and other other methods to to help people. Yeah, and when you and when you mix your 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 implicit bias in with <laughs> with that, you know, you already black people are bad. <laughs> yes. You know, yes. you know, are drugs. <laughs> you know, so yeah, uh, there there we have a long way to go, but mm -hmm. hopefully. Um, you know, we're still saying this even after Floyd, the, the, the one in Atlanta, that was just awful. Um, so, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, I, I was starting to feel good and then that happened and I'm like, okay, so that didn't even have an impact because he just like shot the man in the back, you mm -hmm. know, right away. So I I just hope that that we we really are headed in in a you know a better direction. Like you say, we we have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. But I I really thank you for for this time and and uh, sharing the information on on how to help our kids and even even the parents through the through this difficult time mm -hmm. um, because um, sometimes you just you know you know just need somebody to talk to or somebody to to give you some advice on, mm -hmm. on what you should be doing or what you shouldn't be doing. So Dr. Hammond, I absolutely thank you. You're always amazing. You always have the best advice and you're beautiful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but I threw that out there. <laughs> definitely, definitely. So uh, we're going to end this session, but we, we can do it again. I, I, I'm trying to get the hang of this Zoom. Um, uh -huh. This is really not my area, but... <laughs> <laughs> but we'll we'll get there and um thank you again uh thank everyone that that um that thank you um harriet appreciate you uh, thank you so much we we're planning on um uploading it to our youtube if we can get that done because i had a hard time getting on my computer today so uh, hopefully it'll be in the cloud so um uh, dr hammond you could go ahead and stop the recording now